live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM World of Watson 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Las Vegas, Mandalay Bay Convention Center with IBM World of Watson. This is SiliconANGLE's theCUBE, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante, head of research at wikibon.com. Our next guest is Mary Glackman, who's the Senior Vice President of VP, of Sci Senior Vice President of Science and Forecast Operations at the Weather Company. So, super excited. What a, sounds like a great job. See that weather data we always geek out on. Certainly, we saw the catastrophe of the hurricane that could have been worse this past month. So, um, very, very timely conversation. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you, thrilled to be here. So obviously IBM is getting into the weather business, but you see it play out on Internet of Things, you're seeing it play out as an interesting acquisition because now weather factors into a lot of things and something that's near and dear to our heart is autonomous vehicles. Absolutely. Which is an area you don't really kind of correlate weather with cars. How does that relate? I mean, how does... Well, it's, it has incredible relationships there. First, unfortunately, almost uh, an extremely large percentage, if I'm recalling correctly, about 70% of accidents are weather related, so that's an attention getter right there. Seven zero. Yes, seven zero. I think that's about yeah. right. I haven't looked at that recently. It's a big number. It's Either a big number, that. it's a big number, and we're excited about connected cars for, connected vehicles, really, for a number of things. One is, um, each of these vehicles gives us environmental information, so think about how your windshield wiper, how fast it's going, a whole set of that. We know something about how quickly the rain is falling. Think about every time your ABS thing engages there, we know something about the road surface there, whether it's wet or cold. We're obviously getting temperature information off of there. But what we want to do at the weather company IBM is what we're already doing in aviation, is treating these vehicles as a two-way street extract that environmental information off of them and then provide them back a precise, accurate forecast. So in aviation today, we do this for turbulence uh, forecasting. We take information off of the airplane and with our partner GoGo, uh, we provide them back a turbulence alert. So as the planes are flying down, um, you can warn everybody behind you like that. So I think the internet of things. So you, the, the trade off, my Wi Fi for checking email and streaming movies for a Absolutely. more comfortable ride. Absolutely. <laughs> a, a, safer, a, safer, a, safer a safer ride, ride yeah. especially for those people that don't keep their seatbelt on. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so and less wear and tear. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. <laughs> because no, I'm always complaining right. about how slow the Wi Fi is. <laughs> um, and it's satellite based, so it's going to land, uh, down, right. it's going to ground. Okay, yeah. so, so that's, that's, that's really using precise measurement of the instrument instrumentation of the plane. Exactly. And then you've got other data about the path. We are so excited about data. So if you think about weather, there's all those historical data. You know, we've had observations at airports for, since we've had airplanes, you know, to do that. But you're seeing this fill in at the, um, at the weather company. We have a network of private weather stations. These are weather enthusiasts like yourself that have purchased a weather station, have it in their backyard, over 200,000 and most of our growth, growth is global. So you're starting to see it go into areas where we've had a lack of observations like India, parts of Africa. Super exciting to see that. And in other traditional sources like satellites, we have the great big, I, I like to call them the Sentinel satellites that the governments launch, but now we have all these CubeSats coming into play that are bringing really in interesting environmental information. It's a, it's a really a pretext to the trend that's happening because what's going on is, is that you're using crowdsource like gamification of weather stations, that's getting right. smaller and faster and cheaper with devices, Right. and you're adding that into your existing system. That's right, and I, I love your tagline of extracting the signal from the noise. That's exactly what we're doing. If you have a lot of data like that, it's not going to be the highest quality data, but there's a signal in it, and that's what we extract. And you want, you know what to look for, too, because right. unlike they have one stream, you have other data that could tell you about that data. Exactly. So, so Mary, how does it work? You got this distributed you know, device network that's collecting all this weather data. You got models. 
How much of the data actually goes back to the models? How much stays at the edge? Do you send the model to the data? How does it all work? The okay, of it? Um, so if you're going to run any model, you'd like to get the best set of highly quality controlled data to, to make it run. And we run a model at the weather company that we do, and we do it very custom for particular uses. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example over the northeast corridor of the U.S., you know, that area between D.C. up to Boston that's so heavy, including New York City. We'll run a custom model for them with maximum information in it at a micro scale, really small scale. But what we really do to do our global solution is we take um, forecast models from all around the globe. We have about 160 of these. So we take the model output from the National Weather Service in this country, from the UK's Met Office, uh, from the European Center, from the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. We take all of those and with a machine learning algorithm, we produce the best forecast. And we do it time and time again. You can see, any, uh, we can be your best model any day of the week by machine learning on top of all of the models. Uh, to and do so that. you begin to understand the biases of each of those? Ab absolutely, in real time. So if your model you know, isn't tracking the storm particularly well, you're getting less weight in our, you know, the algorithm understands that machine learning is uh, adjusting on the fly. And the vast majority of the data comes back to the model, or does it sort of stay in place and you bring no. the model to the data? Or? Well, for us, we bring model output with that, but model output is tremendously dense. Uh, yeah. You think of a model that's run every eight kilometers all around the globe. Think of time steps that are at least hourly, if not finer resolution. Think of it going out to 14 days in time. T an incredible amount of data comes in and flows back and forth. I was mentioning earlier, we take in 100 terabytes of data a day at the weather company. We're ingesting that kind of and data. Yeah. We're talking physically, speed physically. of light coming in Th to physically. a central location, physically. and then you apply the model there. Right. Okay. Right. That's a lot of ingestion. That's a lot of ingestion. You get a lot of indigestion of the data. <laughs> Uh, but, that's, uh, but that's interesting, so I want to ask you about that. So obviously, I want to, the ingestion's key, but one of the things that's coming up in the, in the database world, and this comes up in all of our shows we go to, you have database guys who are trained computer science guys who know schemas. Oh yeah, they can handle unstructured data. But what's going on now is that they ingest everything and think they're going to figure it out, but if you think about real time, weather's real time, time series data is not really good anymore after the time it's needed. So maybe think about staging that differently. So, so, There's new practices emerging with time series specifically. Yeah. What are you seeing there? Because you guys are dealing with this every day. You, got, you don't want to swallow the basketball, be that snake, if you will, when you so don't need John, it. So John, that, that's such a perfect question. Um, you really teed it up. So IBM bought us, I would say, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, because weather impacts virtually every business. Number two is we have a great forecast. But number three, we're completely running on the cloud. And so we manage all of this data in the cloud, coming and going. We have a data platform that we're now in the process of commercializing to do that because we've kind of solved that problem. Real-time transactions. I was just talking to a customer earlier, running a uh, nationwide set of golf courses. Has to have a really good forecast for the golf course. You know, we're exposing our data stream to them and they said they'd never had such an easy integration. We gave them the APIs, they were up and running the next day. And what's there, what's there obviously besides customer satisfaction? Is there concern around like lightning? Obviously golfers don't want to get struck by so, lightning. What's the so issue with golf So a couple things, courses? safety is one issue, um, but it's about optimizing. And in that case, if you think about a golf course, you want to really minimize the number of chemicals you use, but you can't afford to let pests come in. You know, you can't have blighted yeah. areas in there. So they're running, uh, we expose a couple of variables to them for temperature, precip and all. They know when certain pests uh, will breed yeah. and they know when to do uh, apply chemicals. So we're helping them. You're a cognitive uh, greenskeeper, well, basically well, <laughs> for them. <laughs> I think you should think about weather forecasting is, Yesterday's metric um, used to be to make a great forecast. Today and tomorrow's metric is to make a great decision. So it's not good enough to have the right forecast. Yeah. You have to be helping people make the right decision, and that's what well, we Ginny do. Well, Ginny Romney all says the in the time. commercial, a lot of the data is you know hidden. Uh, Bob Pacino has dark, dark data. data. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of dark data. It reminds me of the you know under the valley of the web, but dark meaning invisible. Right. But that being said, you can only do forecast. That was your best outcome. That's now right. you're saying. Okay, that's table stakes. 
What's the decision that you make with That's the known right. data? So what we really want to do, going back to an airline example, is we want to tell them how much fuel to put on that plane because O'Hare is liable to be in a ground stop you know, for a certain period of time and they're going to have a slower ingest rate. So you know, we're jumping behind, beyond what's the ceiling forecast, what's the visibility forecast, yeah. right to the impact and giving you the forecast you know, that's, for that. That's a great example, the plane one. I talked to the vice chairman of United Airlines on a panel I did with GE one time and he said literally they, they save over a billion dollars hard cash using IOT and data right. just on how to move petroleum around to the fuels. Absolutely. You're talking about something specific where there's potentially life savings, but more importantly, it's real money. It's optimization. It's, and I mean, it's real cash that it, they it, save. It, it absolutely is, and it touches areas you wouldn't think about. In the consumer part of our business, we can tell advertisers when to advertise, and I'm not talking about snow shovels and snowstorms. I'm talking about when people buy more yogurt because they buy it under certain meteorological Very conditions. Very nuanced. Very nuanced, <laughs> yeah, and we have all of those insights. That's the signal so, from the noise. So you say that it's all about ultimately making the, the good decision, the right decision, and, and it's not just about having accurate forecasts, but that is, as John said, table stakes. And people like to joke about the weather, during that whole deflate gate thing, Bill Belichick was saying, <laughs> ah, the weather forecasts are terrible, and everybody's, ah, they pile on. What does your data show in terms of the accuracy of a forecast over the last Whatever, n years. Pick your. So you know our overall forecast accuracy. If you pick a measure like temperature, you know, and getting that right within a degree, we're in the mid 80s, 80 percent to do mm -hmm. that now. But what we really want to. But the look weather stations now coming online, you're going to probably get more precise. Yes, we're getting more precise in I that. I can imagine. But you know, let me tell you one of the things we're really focused on because this is what's so important to so many of our users. It's not really what that temperature forecast is, but when I'm going back to the gentleman I was talking about with the golf courses, he really wants to know when he's going to get a quarter of an inch or more of precipitation because that quarter of an inch makes a difference to him um, in terms of what he has to do for irrigation. Yeah. So he doesn't really care whether it's going to rain or not, he cares how much it's going to rain, and he cares yeah. exactly about yeah. the amount of and rain. And that's important, it's uh, in place and, and how you do it there. Well, we don't, I can't cite okay. the visibility thing for that, okay, but my but point is, we'll, That's a new challenge. Yeah, it's a new challenge, on. and No, there's the impact of the customer. That's, in, that's an example of the impact of the customer benefit. Well, I want to even take it a level like that. We can make him a forecast for that quarter inch, but we'll give him a confidence probability with it and then he can weight that with his other factors. You and, know, and, and then so, learn over time, improve right. his or her model. Exactly. Uh, okay, but this, so this is what, what I just learned is it's not, like you say, it's not just about temperature and is it going to rain, what should right. I wear? You're being presented with new business challenges that are weather related that may not even show up on our little weather app. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think every business needs to think about both um, how they can capitalize on weather and how they can minimize uh, the costs of weather. Because I think both there's both sides of the coin there. Mira, uh, interesting background that you have. First of all, this is a great conversation. We can geek out on weather, but I want to ask weather. a personal question. <laughs> how did you get into this? Because um, you have a computer science degree right. from Maryland, I noticed that on, on, your, on your profile. Uh, and you also um, worked for the, um, the U.S. Uh, secre uh, Secretary? Well, I actually spent 20 years in the National Weather Service, um, and I, I have about 30 credits in meteorology as well. I have a, a the so I'm old, right? We can see my gray hair. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the late 70s, it was all about you know, these great big computers and weather forecasting. So there was this nice marriage between mathematics, computer science, and meteorology. Yeah. In fact, in Maryland, it was all in the same hallway. Yeah. Um, but how I really got into that uh, was as a child in being, you know, really being Im impressed with storms we got caught in, including one tropical storm with no warning. Um, you, and, you got caught in. Right. Right. Really? I, our elementary school was closed down at 11 o'clock and we were released with the winds blowing and my mother would tell you the nightmare story of trying to hold on to everybody. Because we take it for granted and that now. that impacted you. There was you. no satellites, no weather satellites right, yeah. watching well, things. Well the Nor'easter is on the east coast is one historic storm that right. wiped out everyone. Right. Um, so you got into that. We'd love to ha have you on the more on the Cube. We just had Grace Hopper last week um, uh, talking about women in computing and going back to the old to how math and the contribution in, in the industry across the board. But what's interesting is, that, is the global warming question. I want to ask you about global warming because that's something that didn't come up in the debates I was kind of upset about, um, the last debate. Global warming, how is this going to uh, evolve in your mind? Obviously, how real is it? I mean, you see the numbers. It's yeah. pretty staggering. It 
seems to be very real. Yeah, um, so it, it is real. There's just no question about that. And we, we have tried to shift the language to climate change because not everybody gets warm. Yep. You know, but, change, the, yep. but things are changing. I think we're going to see these impacts and I think we're going to see a lot of them play out in extreme events. So we know already, if you go back and look at um, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy that came into the Northeast, we can tell, you know, the science has been done to talk about how much more extensive the damage was because the sea level has changed dramatically, you know, or yep. noticeably, I should say, not dramatically, uh, yeah. over this past well, dramatically century. dramatically given the storm, given yes. the, the flood in lower Manhattan. Yes, so I think that any business that's assuming the last 10 years of weather looks like the next 10 years is making a mistake. Yeah. You're going to see more extreme events. It's, you know, it's common, it didn't used to be common to see three inches of rain, what we saw in Louisiana, you know, a couple weeks ago, I guess it's been yeah. a month or six weeks ago now. Uh, very common, so um, people that are uh, businesses and communities that are impacted by this are asking the question, because the question really is, how often am I going to see this, quote, 50-year event? And the answer is you're seeing it a lot more A often. lot more sooner and yeah. more frequency of those. Is there anything in the data that you're learning now with uh, cloud computing and some of the, you mentioned so high- So let me say one, make one point that I wanted to get in here. Okay. Uh, and that's the question about how cognitive and cloud computing and all are going to help weather forecasting get smarter. And one of the things that we're excited about in IBM is the opportunity to have Watson look at the reams, go back and look at our past reams of data and help us understand some patterns. Yeah. So for example, we know today that a warming pattern in the Pacific, uh, a, an unusual warming pattern in the Pacific, results in a drought in the middle of the country. What other patterns haven't we noticed? And could Watson find them so for us? So go dig through the go, archives. Go dig through those archives and find out what the scientists you know, haven't seen. How big is the archive? Well, it's big. I mean, big. how big uh, does it go back? I mean, how many years? You know, I mean, there's obviously <laughs> text paper. Has it been digitized? I mean, oh, yes, yeah. so all of that's been digitized. Um, you know, the federal agencies, in this case, NOAA, my, where I worked for a long time, uh, the Climatic Data Center there, has all of those archives uh, available. And you know, you have really good data going back to post-World War II. And I think it would be, you know, we're, we're anxious to, that's to be put huge. Watson loose on that. Well, the, can they can throw some compute at that too. So you, you can right. theoretically sequence genomes in five minutes now. So potentially have Watson just Yeah, and help, uh, help us kind of figure out too, maybe there's some things we can do. I'm confident there is in the forecast for the week three and week four. And think about how important that would okay. be and for a, And there's a predictive trains. element here as well. Absolutely. It, it, the past is not prologue, and, and you talked about you know, climate change. So that's another factor. In, that has models. to be put together. All right. My final question, Mary, for you is: What's the coolest thing that you've seen uh, that you've seen in the past couple years? Um, one that you've seen observed in technology and weather, and two, the coolest thing that you've done. <laughs> so I think the the coolest thing I've observed. I think that some of the observing that's done from space is awesome. Um, I'll put in a plug that uh, NOAA is about to launch a new geostationary satellite in two weeks and it's going to be a game changer in terms of the ability to look at Earth and it, you know. Uh, so I think that that technology of space-based observing, which lets you do the whole Earth, is, is just awesome. The coolest thing I think I have done is uh, stu stood on the Greenland ice sheet. Both the coolest thing and the most sobering thing is to stand on the Greenland ice sheet and listen to it calve off. So you talk about climate change, you could stand there and watch it and within your line of sight, you could see where that ice sheet was in 1970 and how quickly it's eroding. It's moving, great. Mary, thanks so much, great conversation. We could have gone 45 minutes <laughs> uh, talking about weather <laughs> and all the coolness of the tech behind it, the intersection of technology and just impact to, to life. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, it was a lot Mary of fun. Mary Cochran, who's the Senior Vice President of Science and Forecast Operations at the Weather Company, part of an IBM business. We'll be back with more weather and signal here on theCUBE. After this short break, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>